Hey everyone, exciting announcement here from the BlockWorks Podcast Network. We are hiring two podcast hosts to build a show with us called Lightspeed. The TLDR of Lightspeed is that it is a show for builders, tinkerers, and lovers of technology. It's a callback to the heyday of Silicon Valley where great tech was built in garages, not in corporate fortresses, and was truly the Wild West. Lightspeed is an exploration of crypto from the perspective of a builder and an engineer who's designing for scale and is interested in onboarding the next billion users into crypto. If this show sounds exciting to you, you have a background in podcast hosting or content creation, go to the careers page of BlockWorks. That's blockworks.co slash careers. I've also linked it in the show notes here. You can just click there. It'll take you right to the page. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm Mike Ippolito underscore. You can just slide right into my DMs and we'll set up some time to talk. We'd love to hear from you. We are super, super excited about this show. So please apply. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined by the CEO of Van Eck, Jan Van Eck. Jan, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. Good to be here. Yeah, I really appreciate it. All right. So I would love to, maybe before we get into some of the topics du jour here uh, around macro and Bitcoin, I'd actually love to get just a sense of your history. When when I joined crypto you know, five or so years ago, I had Van Eck in my mind as kind of the one serious asset manager that was taking Bitcoin seriously. And I would love to just sort of get your, your kind of history on how you joined Van Eck and what made you take Bitcoin seriously before many of your peers. Let me give you a little bit of the background. So uh, Van Eck was founded in 1955, and I would describe us as a macro firm, meaning, you know, the financial markets are nice, but they really sit within a broader society, right? And so it matters what's happening in politics and technology, and that affects what asset classes you want to have in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And just to give you some perspective on how that changes over time, you know, in the 1920s, if we were sitting around putting a portfolio together, it would really be bonds. In fact, you know, mm. it, was a, it was debatable whether it was responsible from a fiduciary duty to invest in equities 100 years ago. And, you know, in 1968, uh, the, the hot asset class was the nifty 50 stocks. Those were the growth stocks uh, of the day. So, um, But in 1968, my father, who started the firm, started the first gold fund in the United States. And uh, I want to tell that story because it uh, explains why you really need this sort of macro perspective on investments and what you want to hold in your portfolios. So in 1968, uh, gold was fixed at $35 an ounce. It had been fixed for the entirety of U.S. history, de facto. Um, But he looked at the government spending at the time and the growth in the money supply, and he said, this is just not going to hold. There is going to be a break. And if you're a historian, you, I think, have an appreciation for the future. I'm a a functional historian. I don't really care about the past. All I really care about is the future. But what can we learn from the past? And one of the things you can learn is that change can be unbelievably rapid. Uh, Mm -hmm. Change in technologies, change in asset prices. And so, um, so he invested. He started uh, investing in gold mining shares. Uh, I like to remind Bitcoiners that he couldn't buy gold bullion at the time. Uh, why? Because it was illegal. Uh, since FTR um, yeah. made some changes uh, in, 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 in fixing the banking system, um, all of bullion was uh, supposedly delivered to the federal government. So you could buy coins, but you couldn't buy bullion. Okay, so here we are. Van Eck has started the first gold fund in the United States that funded phenomenally well in the 1970s. And this thing called Bitcoin comes around. And listen, I would say from the get go that we don't have proof of what Bitcoin is as an investment. We can have a mental model. Uh, So I have to put a big caveat around that to begin with. But I did noticed that a lot of the investors who were interested in gold were also now interested in Bitcoin, probably different demographics. So in early 2017, I asked my colleagues, what do you think about Bitcoin? And they were like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, let's do the work. Uh, Mm. So spent a lot of time listening to podcasts, um, invest like the best, you know, had this series, but also reading white papers and talking to people. Um, and listen, it's not like crypto hadn't been on our, my radar screen. Like I'm constantly looking for disruptive technologies. Um, as you may know, we, we got into ETFs in 2006, which has disrupted asset management in a big way. So I'm always, you know, on the look, lookout for what could, could change. But anyway, long story short, to get to the answer of your question, 
in 2017, yeah, but then we filed for uh, a you know, Bitcoin ETF, uh, believing, hey, listen, gold might be disruptive, but we want to be participating in this new asset class. Now, today, I probably think of Bitcoin going together with gold, like silver sometimes is paired with gold. But uh, yeah, that's that's the uh, the origin story of our company in crypto. Yeah, that's a really helpful history. And I've got a whole bunch of questions for what you just outlined there. But, you know, you described yourself as a macro firm or Van Eck as a macro firm. So maybe we could actually just start from sort of a 10,000 foot vantage point. And I would love to so- sort of try to parse out what your view about what is important in the macro environment and what isn't. You know, because on the one hand, we've kind of got stress in the banking sector, right? We've had a couple of high profile bank failures over the course of the last couple months. And now it looks like First Republic is in trouble again as well. We've had a debt ceiling debacle, but it looks like we just averted that and raised the debt ceiling by $1.5 billion. You know, the kind of history of your firm, right, is your father saying, hey, this is not ultimately sustainable. How sustainable does it look to you now? And what are the things that are important to pay attention to versus what are what's maybe not quite so important to pay attention to? You know, I don't want to be over dramatic, but I do think that uh, we should question the whole structure of the commercial banking system. <laughs> um, mm. And le- let me explain that. Commercial banks are inherently fragile institutions. If everyone goes to the ATM on the same day, literally no bank can survive that kind of run on deposits. So that's why we have a central bank that we set up 100 years ago to provide a line of credit to banks that need liquidity, short-term liquidity. And the playbook is that simple. Um, why do I say that you know, the, the role of, central, uh, of commercial banks is being questioned? Well, first of all, um, should banks be making loans? <laughs> this sounds like a very basic thing, but after the financial crisis, the federal government passed Dodd-Frank and they basically said, you know, our big banks should not be making risky loans. And so it used to be that if you uh, you had a dollar in deposits uh, to a major bank, that's and they would lend a dollar. I'm kind of oversimplifying, but now they only lend 60 or 70 cents. And all the big banks have gotten out of risky lending, right? Subprime, remember, I don't know if you ever heard the word subprime, but sure. you, you couldn't let, use that word at Bank of America 10 years ago, right? So that's, if, all that lending has now shifted away from commercial banks into alternative credit funds, BDCs, and things like that. So, um, so, so commercial banks are just lending less, number one. And then number two is sort of, well, they're so fragile, right? I mean, if you need the central government to bail you out, like, is the government going to be a reliable backstop? And I think what you see now is the government as predicted, being a little political about it. You know, oh, we don't like crypto. You're a crypto bank? Bang, I'm going to shoot you. Or, you know, Credit Suisse, you know, what you've messed up one too many times on your risk management or money laundering or whatever upset the Swiss government. So boom, I'm going to shoot Credit Suisse. I'm not going to shoot UBS. I'm going to shoot Credit Suisse. Mm. And I think it's impossible to know. Well, the government has not explained objective criteria for who they bail out and who they don't. Because remember, it's just a line of check, right? You call them up on the phone, say, I, I need money, send me the money. And, and that's all they're supposed to be doing. The criteria for who gets the money and who doesn't, like, um, uh, you, know, you know, like First Republic, why are they not getting the money? Or why did they get the money in a distorted way? I think investors are starting to question that. Okay, so number one, uh, commercial banks are providing less of a transmission mechanism to the real economy by lending less. There's more alternative lending. And secondly, the, the kind of reliable backstop, it's, it's not clear when the government bails out whom. And so everyone in technology got reminded of this in a dramatic way through Silicon Valley Bank, where we got to experience a weekend not knowing what the government was going to do. And so I think we've been reminded of that fragility uh, and then there's this model of, uh, of stable coins out there uh, or money market funds where people realize, OK, I, I want to own a dollar. I want to get paid a little bit of interest and I want the collateral to be 100 percent transparent and reliable. Um, and so that's not what banks do. No. <laughs> right. Banks are taking your money and doing lots of different things. But I think, you know, what what's happened in, in so far year to date is. 
uh, tens of billions of dollars moving effectively to money market funds or stable coins, whatever you want to call them. That type of vehicle, it's not a financial institution that's providing money to the real economy. So I think, I don't know how this plays out, but I, I do think that we've seen this, you can at least argue, a big restructuring of banks over the last 10 years along the lines of what I just described. Yeah, I agree with you. I think people are waking up to the idea that, you know, I've heard banks described as levered bond funds, and I had never really used those words before, but or heard those words used to describe banks. But that's kind of mechanically what's going on into the background, right? When you deposit your funds at a bank, they're turning around and and lending that and the the capitalization ratio is at least 10 to 1, right? At most banks, I think it's required to be, you know, 7.5% backed by by actual equity dollars. So definitely, I think a lot most people in America kind of reminds me of the old Henry Ford quote, which is it's well enough that the people of America don't understand the banking system. Or if they did, there'd be a riot in the streets tomorrow. Right. And I think people to your point are starting to to question that. So yeah, I don't really know what what comes next either. I, you know, I've heard a theory, maybe that I could try out on you and, and sort of get your perspective on it. I, I really like the insight that you had about investors are starting to wake up and question, well, why is this bank getting a bailout versus this bank being allowed to fail? And the I'm not sure if you've ever come across Russell Napier, but he has this very interesting theory about credit provisioning, which is when there's a bunch of stress in the economy, basically the bank, the you know, the government is going to step in and decide who gets credit, right? If everyone's in trouble, they're going to provision credit. And inherently that's a political decision. So I'm curious, like what if like how you think about that theory, and then what are the implications of that if it keeps going on? Yeah, I've heard of Russell Napier. I haven't kind of uh, read read on him and, and that theory um, in particular. Uh, but there there is a book I'm I'm starting to read uh, about the fragility of banking systems and banking systems in different societies. And I think uh, it, it is an interesting phenomenon. Why do Canadian banks, which is kind of an oligopoly, but they're very stable? Why do they not get into more more trouble? Why do American banks seem to get into trouble every ten years? Um, and then, of course, you have other countries where there's even less reliable banking system, like Argentina. So I think ultimately that's right. I mean, it's sort of part of my big thesis, which is the financial markets just sit inside a political, economic, and technology world, and they're you know they're, they're, you know, they're consequences from those major developments. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. How do you see politics kind of continuing to intercede on financial markets in general? Definitely, you know, you have, uh, I'll make the assumption you've got a couple of years on me, but just in terms of my memory of politics in the US, it's just never seemed more vitriolic than it has today. People just really can't seem like they can see eye to eye. And, you know, again, maybe as a, as a functional historian, you know, I, I also love looking looking throughout periods of history and some of the stuff that politicians, I see politicians doing today almost reminds me of like bread and circuses in in Rome, right? When you had when you had a slowdown in the growth of that kind of empire, you had emperors that were not actually doing things that were beneficial to the citizens, but they were doing things like, hey, here's some entertainment and hey, here's some free bread and hey, here's this and that. They were basically handouts. And you can kind of look at what you know Gavin Newsom did, and not to pick on any one particular person, but some of the tax, uh, the uh, you know the rebates on gas over in California, or you know pre- uh, President Biden suggesting that he was going to return or forgive a certain percentage of student debt. Those look to me a little bit more like handouts than they do holistic solutions for kind of the the position that we're in. So can you talk a little bit more and try to parse that? Like, how do you see politics continuing to intersect with financial markets? Yeah, um, 
I wouldn't focus so much on uh, you know the rhetoric of politicians. Uh, we, we've had some very contentious elections and periods of time going yeah. back to the founding when uh, you know people looked at their political opponents and thought they were you know supporting George Washington as a king. And of course, that was fighting words way beyond whatever you're going to call Joe Biden, <laughs> right? So uh, That's you know, point. so we've had these well, and we fought a civil war. So we've had very uh, divisive points in our history, and we've been able, been able to work through them. Uh, listen, I'd say any believer in gold or fiat will point out that no paper currency has ever survived over mm. a long period of time, because governments, whether they're kings or democracies, are always tempted to spend too much money. Mm. And what I liked about your question is I think you're getting at this um, some of these economic policies are to the point of how much do you use the central bank or the government's checkbook to right. pay for um, social policies that you that you want? And are we in a new paradigm or not from that kind of a perspective? Right. It's the modern monetary theory policy or put in other words, using the Fed balance sheet to pay for absolutely everything that you want. And, you know, where I'm at today in 2023 is I really don't know. And I think we have a lot of uncertainty about how to structure our portfolios. And, and my point there just to investors is you really want to diversify. But let me drill down on the on the paradigm fight that I think we're, we're going through. If you look at the federal funds rate, um, you'll see that over the last 12 years, it was basically zero. Right. And right. now, now it's gone back to what I'll call normal levels. And I, I think the biggest question is, do you think we can stay at 5% for a long period of time? Because there are, the other school of thought is we have so much debt that something is going to break. And the new pair, because of demographics and the amount of debt, that actually 1% or 0% or is the new normal. And we're going to get back to that really quickly. And I, I don't know if I knew the answer, I would <laughs> I would give you my opinion. But um, I think that's a really interesting paradigm. Let me push on why it might be going back to zero. Not that I agree with it. Number one is so you look at Japan, right? You see another major developed market similar to the United States in terms of wealth. They also, um, you know, have, you know, well, they have a declining demographics today. We, we, ours is sort of flattening, I would say. Um, but they're they're using the central bank to basically cover up and keep interest rates super low, right? They spent six hundred billion dollars at the end of last year. Uh, when people say what happened, why did the markets melt up in January? I'm like, there was so much money coming out of Asia. How could the markets not melt up? So anyway, so you have Japan, and then you also have the example in the UK of Liz Trust, where she said, "Listen, we're going to spend more money." She wanted to cut taxes, and the market said, "Absolutely not." And so the central bank said, oh, you know, that thing about quantitative tightening, we're just kidding. You know, so we're going to bring the central bank checkbook out again. So that's the question. You know, will the Fed be in a box and are we going to have to do what Japan did and what the UK did and get back to massive expansion of the, the balance sheet? Um, and at, if we do that at some point, um, I think investors are going to say, well, that's a nice currency you have there, but I'd rather own gold and Bitcoin. Yeah, I would actually love to to dig into sort of your thoughts on the balance sheet. Maybe it's a little bit wonky and people in finance love to debate it, but there are very different viewpoints on what that ever expanding amount of the Fed's balance sheet really means. So I would love to get kind of your interpretation when you look at that number going up. What does that mean to you? And then maybe we could talk a little bit about Japan because they are just such a funny example. But let's I, I would love to get your thoughts on the balance sheet. Well, you know, I'm not an, a Fed expert, but mm. this is how I kind of think about it. Um, the money in the system affects the prices of financial assets and everything in your portfolio. So the and and the balance sheet is as important as interest rates. So when I read articles in the press, they talk about, oh, they're going to raise 25 basis points and they're going to stop raising. I say you are missing uh, I think you and I are on the same page here. You're missing really a large, large part of the equation. You have to look at their balance sheet, right? right? Because if they're expanding their balance sheet, but raising rates, they're not really tightening the amount of money that's sloshing around in the economy. 
and financial assets won't crash if the Fed is, you know, is keep, you know, expanding that. So, um, you know, so that's kind of how I look at the balance sheet as its effect on the financial markets. I don't think there's a theory that I'm aware of that can tell you if there's a natural limit to that or not. It doesn't feel healthy. Um, and, you know, I, I was, I guess, in a way excited that Powell was going to try to shrink the balance sheet and normalize it. Uh, we'll see if he continues on that path or not. Um, because I think it, it, regardless, you want a central bank to have policy tools to fix the next recession or pandemic or whatever it is. And so you want them to have the ability to expand their balance sheet in times of crises. Um, so that those are kind of my my thoughts around it. Yeah, I tend to agree. I, I think it's it's hard to exactly pinpoint what it is. I, I sort of tend to look at it as kind of a gauge of the amount of intervention that the Fed is doing and therefore the amount of intervention that's required for the economy to function in a somewhat normal way. But I agree with you that the level at which it's simply too much, it's just been pretty perplexing. So, you know, your dad in the late 60s, right, kind of noted that this was a problem. There's a great book that many people have read on uh, Wall Street Market Wizards, right, written by Jack Schwager, interviewing some of the big traders at the time. I think that was written in 89. They're talking about the same stuff that you and I are talking about right now. And perhaps the best example of that is Japan, where for years, they're, you know, 10 to 20 years ahead of us on this crazy monetary experiment where they've just held rates to zero. I think debt to GDP is 220% over there. And even at the low levels that they are, I think it's, it's something like 25% of their annual budget goes towards just servicing their debt. So I don't know what you think about that. I mean, I, I guess we're all just in kind of wait and see mode. There's been a transition away from Kuroda over there to the new guy. But do you have any kind of thoughts on Japan and whether or not the U.S. is destined to head in that same direction? Not not in Japan per se, but it's a it's a warning to maybe not take all this stuff so seriously um, right. And that it could take a very, very long time. You know, what I said about all paper money going to zero in the long term, sometimes it takes hundreds of years. And yeah. so that's, what's weird that we have this sort of financialization of everything phenomenon going on and how long, uh, governments can effectively manipulate markets. Right. I mean, that's one of the things that I like to, to point out is that, uh, and, and as a historian, why things can change so quickly. And what I said, um, you know, recently in an interview is I was pounding the table on if you're ever going to own gold or Bitcoin, own it now. And so that is my lesson, because we because things can move so fast. I think a lot of investors fool themselves into thinking, oh, I can adjust quickly to one thing or another. And in this day and age, asset prices can move so fast um, that, that you probably won't. And, or behaviorally, you'll be like, oh, I missed it. And so I would say um, shorter term cycle is you do look at the Fed and it is likely that they will stop QT or raising rates or a combo of the two in the next year or two. Right. Yeah. I think that's kind of consensus. And my point and why I pound the table is now is you can't time that. We have no yeah. idea when that's going to happen. And so you want to be positioned now, you know, realizing it may be way too early. Yeah, I te I in complete agreement with you there. And maybe just before we segue into gold and Bitcoin, I would love to get your thoughts on the dollar. The dollar had a pretty epic run last year. It's sold off quite a bit since then. I think there was an article that came out just this week where Stan Druckenmiller said his one conviction play was shorting the US dollar. So would love to maybe get your kind of higher level thoughts about because you see the dollar all over the place in the news these days, right? You know, well, I guess he's not on Fox anymore, but I saw Tucker Carlson's been talking about death of the dollar. It's like really seemed to enter mainstream consciousness in a way that it hadn't before. So I'd love to get your kind of high level thoughts on the dollar. And then what do you make of the the drop bet on on shorting the dollar? Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, I do think the dollar kind of peaked at the end of last year. Um Number one, but I'm not like, first of all, we don't really have views on currencies. I think they're really hard to predict. But yeah. over my career, I think my my kind of North Star is that uh, currency strength follows the strength of the economy and not so much interest rates. So uh, I do think we were at sort of peak America. 
um, at, at the end of last year, right? Because Europe was drowning in the war and didn't know what it was doing as far as energy supplies and everything. Um, China was in a recession. Uh, Japan was kind of floundering. So we looked really good and we do have great companies that are doing advanced technologies and we're leading the world in lots of different ways. And I still think that's true. So because of that, I find it hard to be a super dollar bear. Uh, having said that, <laughs> one, one you know, major event that other countries are reacting to was the, the extreme sanctions that we applied to Russia. And people are saying, listen, this is this de-dollarization thing that people are chatting about on Wall Street now. It's, a, it's definitely a thing on the margin. People don't trust the U.S. government not to use sanctions to take their money. It's that yeah. simple. So, yeah. OK, they're going to keep it away from us. They're going to use more of the renminbi um, or gold or both. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's, uh, you know, I think that's, that's a reality. Uh, so all those things are going on. It's, it's not a, a major call one way or the other, but it's definitely going to be a trend, I think. Yeah. So let's transition to talk a little bit about gold and Bitcoin. I would, again, to use a, a metaphor that, that Stanley Druckenmiller used that has kind of stuck with me is he described, you know, gold and Bitcoin is basically kind of being two sides of the same, the same bet. His, his analogy was that look, when you have uh, kind of a stagflationary sort of sort of environment where you've got high inflation but not a whole lot of growth, you want to own gold. But when you actually have kind of the environment we had in 2020, 2021, where there's currency debasement, uh, but you know, things are things are growing, then that's when you want to own Bitcoin. So let me just kind of throw that to you as a jumping off point, get your thoughts there, and then we'd love to get your thoughts on. Gold versus Bitcoin. I don't know. I'm a little bit more of a skeptic, meaning I don't think we know enough. I describe Bitcoin as an eight year old child, where it's such early days in terms of institutional adoption uh, or adoption broadly. Uh, I think a lot of people discovered Bitcoin early and they love it as part of their portfolios. They've made a lot of money in it and they're holding it. And so the question, and then obviously a lot of Americans bought it in the last five years during the various run ups. But it's still not part of a, you know, institutional adoption. I know almost no institutions have bought Bitcoin. No central banks that I know of have bought Bitcoin. So I think that that's what, something that we're looking for in 2023. Will a frontier central bank, maybe out of the Middle East or out of Central America, um, you know, adopt Bitcoin in their portfolios? So there's a long ways to go. So that's why I describe it as an eight-year-old. You know, there's times, you know, where it's volatile. There's times where it's less volatile than the NASDAQ. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's hard to kind of know. I just look at the overall trajectory. And if you look at the overall trajectory, both assets hit all-time highs in 2021, right? Yeah. Like without getting, looking at the day-to-day -day or week-to-week, -week, both assets did well when Silicon Valley Bank had its crisis, yeah. right? So I look at more of, Yes, I guess he's sort of saying they're common, but some outperform others based on, you know, kind of the economic cycle that we own. That may be true. I just I, I wouldn't want to be a super high conviction on that. I just like to own both. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny you bring that up because that Bitcoin and gold, I haven't been tracking gold as closely, but Bitcoin performing well on not that you should ever we should ever be celebrating the collapse of, of banks or anything like that, but that has been extremely validating to the overall thesis of what Bitcoin is supposed to be as opposed to acting like a tech stock, right? I think there's a point in 21 when I was kind of looking at the correlation between things like Tesla and Bitcoin. Oh, I don't really love that, right? That shouldn't be based on what Bitcoin actually is or my long-term view of Bitcoin. You don't love to see those two assets behaving in a correlated way. It's been very interesting to watch this year and see what Bitcoin has done in the wake of these bank failures. And it yeah. feels a little bit to me like a turning point. Like I said, like at the very top of this interview, you know, it's hard to know because we have these mental models, but I'm with you. If mm -hmm. Bitcoin just acts like Tesla, I don't want, I don't want to own Bitcoin. Like I don't need that. Yeah. I've got Tesla already. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you all for listening to On The Margin. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up about a conference that we have coming up in the new year called Permissionless. I'm sure most of you have been there last year. Uh, it is the cultural event of the year. We had over 5,500 people down in Palm Beach. This year, we are moving to Austin, Texas. You know what they say about Texas? Everything's bigger in Texas. <laughs> 
Uh, so last year, we had a really great lineup of speakers. We had the two co-founders of Robinhood, Vlad Tenev and Baiju Bot. We had Chris Dixon. We had some of the folks that have been on the show a whole bunch of times, Jim Bianco, Dan Tapiero, just a phenomenal lineup of speakers. And you can expect the same this year. If you use Margin 10, you will get 10% off on a ticket. Again, that's Margin 10, because I love you guys so much. Click the link at the bottom of the show notes. Hope to see you there in person. I would love to maybe get your, not that anyone has a crystal ball, but kind of how are you thinking over a slightly shorter time frame, say one to two years about, let's kind of bucket things in just in hard assets in general. So we've got gold, Bitcoin, and maybe I'd throw real estate in there. How are you just thinking about the investment environment in general? Like maybe to take us back to the top of this interview, said, oh, it might be a couple more hikes and then maybe a, a pause or things are going to turn over the course of the next two years. How does that translate to, maybe let's let's start with kind of hard assets. Well, if you're if I can talk about all of those, I would say for, sitting here, Bitcoin has got to have the strongest technical case right now for getting involved mm -hmm. uh, because you have the halvening in 12 months. Right. And if you look at prior Bitcoin cycles, that it's just a, it's a great you know, you have you have a, a catalyst, as they like to call it on Wall Street uh, for Bitcoin to rally. Um, it's fallen a lot, like it has in prior bear markets. You've had an absolute liquidation in crypto. All of these are great technical kinds of checks, right? Like good time to buy. Um, I don't quite see the same thing right now for gold. I do. Gold has been flirting with breaking through into all time highs. Uh, I think ultimately, I guess I think it will through through this cycle, but. Uh, there's a lot of skepticism about gold, and also we, you know, we offer gold mining funds. There's a lot of skepticism about the the equities um, in, in the gold market. Uh, real estate, I think, is in this uh, slow motion car crash, um, and so the good thing I would say uh, is that a lot of that lending, like I was talking about before is private it's not done just through the you know some of the regional banks have, have a lot of commercial real estate exposure but in general it's uh, it's diversified so i don't see it causing it, it's sort of a very slow motion thing if you look at china china's been dealing with the real estate problem for like five years right you know japan had this as well these are very long-term you know problems car crashes that take their ways to work through the financial system people need to repair their balance sheets things need to be restructured so it won't be i don't think it'll be a spectacular i think it'll just be a grind yeah i tend to agree with you on that i mean there was a there's a headline i think we've talked about it on, on other shows this week but there's an office building uh in san francisco that was selling for you know, last valued at three hundred million dollars, and there are bids coming in at eighty percent at an eighty percent discount, something like that. And you know, r commercial real estate isn't just one. You know, there are multiple different segments there. So there's like office, then there's industrial, and industrial should be totally fine, right? And maybe office is the thing that's a little bit more in the zeitgeist because everyone's working from home these days. So I'm in I'm in complete agreement with you with you on that. Um, you know, I, I, I hate to make you dust off your, your sort of crystal ball again, but if you had to, everyone is very curious, right, about what the Fed is is going to do. I don't know if you saw actually as a small aside, but uh, I saw Chair Powell actually got, he got pranked by some by some Russian pranksters. Uh, I don't know if you, you saw this and they pretended to be it. President Zelensky. Oh, it's a crazy larger than life story. <laughs> yeah, that, they talked to him for about 15 minutes. He gave his views on where the market was going and rate hikes. And basically what, what he said is, he, I think, you know, he's, his assumption was there are going to be two more 25 basis point hikes in May and June, and then they're probably going to hold rates for around there for, for a while. Is that Does that line up with, with your view as well? And if, if you had to handicap the, the probability that something else is going to break with rates being this high, do you think that's likely at this point, or are we basically through the worst of it with the banking crisis being behind us? So I do think that Chairman Powell and the Fed has been pretty good and pretty transparent in terms of what they were doing in the cycle. They communicated it ahead of time before they started the QT and the rate rises, rate rate increases. So I think that would be a kind of go into the no surprise category. Um, you know, if if you, as I think about this year, and and I, so we've been saying this for a while. There's long term trends and there's shorter term trends, and the shorter term cyclical things are, as we've talked about, there's three: money, government spending, and the economy. So money we know is tight. I mean, whatever he's saying, 
like I don't know how much he'll resume quantitative tightening, but the money is tight. <laughs> Government spending is tight. It's not going to increase. We just had huge check writing during COVID and shortly thereafter. That's not happening, right? Whatever happens this summer with the you know the debt ceiling, that's not happening. And then the world economy is kind of in a slow spot. We know that things have slowed down here. We have to digest all the COVID spending in the economy. China is um, is reopening and 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 growing in a very different point in the cycle, but it's not the boom time China of infrastructure spending and and property and all that kind of stuff. It's more of a a muted China. And I think that's the future of China, um, not to get distracted, but I think the demographic drag on China is really mis, mis, uh, appreciate, underappreciated in the market. So I look at index China growth at something like 2 to 4% a year, nothing like what it used to be. Obviously, it's much bigger. Um, so listen, if you take all those three major forces, they're all kind of blah, in 2023. So that's why I say the water in the bathtub is going to be the same at the end of the year. So financial markets are going to go sideways this year. Um, and, you know, for traditional investors, I'm like, I think fixed income is going to be like a pretty good place to be, um, including high yield. Everyone's worried about a recession. I'm like, this is my point. Who knows what's going to happen through this cycle? So just be diversified and, um, and, and don't hide too much in cash. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of my, yeah, I don't have a view on, on how long the Fed will keep this up. That, that's, I think, that's what the market wants to know. Maybe just in closing here, Jan, I would love to sort of get your perspective on these days you hear a lot of sort of grand proclamations, right? There's going to be a big paradigm shift here, whether it's what we're talking about from a currency standpoint. You also hear this kind of mentioned in the shift from a unipolar to a multipolar world. And maybe we've got some reshoring of supply chains and maybe more consistent inflation over in the United States. But I think everyone has a slightly different flavor on what they think is going to happen. But I think in general, there's kind of this growing consensus that we're in this period of change. In, in some way, shape, or form. And I would just love to get your perspective on, does does that sound right to you? And it does feel like we're at this very pivotal moment where there's this great power competition in between the United States and China, maybe some reshoring action, wh- whatever that might be. Or it's like, hey, I've, I've actually been around a while and people are always talking about this kind of stuff. So can you just maybe help put it in perspective and, and how are you thinking about just the current moment? Um, I, I would say that... Um... Well, the world is always changing and it's changing uh, it, it quickly. I would say in addition to all the things that we've talked about, uh, one of my favorite, I was sitting in a planning meeting for 2023 and like 99% of the discussion was around 2023. And I'm like, you know what? We don't know always what's <laughs> going to happen in the next year, but you can have higher conviction about some of these longer term trends. Um, the two I would highlight is one is just demographics. Um, I think yeah. that China's population is going to go in half in the next 50 to 70 years is unbelievable. If What does that even mean, right? To have a country <laughs> I, of 1.4 billion because of the one child policy going to, let's say, eight, eight, seven or 800 million. Uh, that's just astounding. You see this uh, play out now in, in Japan where the population shrank everywhere last year, except for Tokyo. There's just fewer people. What happens to all the housing stock? So demographics is a for sure thing happening. Uh, and I think it's just interesting to think about. I think what that means is that China will eventually, uh, hopefully become a little bit more inward focused and focused on job creation in their own economy and how to deal with the aging um, and put their resources towards that and a little bit less on guns. Um, anyway, that's a, that's a hope. Uh, the second major uh, technology trend that I focus, that actually is you know, recently focusing on is health technology, healthcare technology. So Rick Edelman uh, said 2030 is the magic year. If you live to 2030, maybe it's more relevant for me than you, but if you live to 2030, you're going to live to be 100 because so many of the massive killers in, of Americans um, from a health perspective, uh, cancer and heart uh, cardiac, cardiac problems are going to be solved in the next seven years. It's wow. kind of amazing to think about. Um, that has obviously major implications for how you should be saving, how long you should be working, 
um, and also for government, the structure of government programs. Uh, maybe he's wrong, but I kind of feel like he's like for sure right, right? Because it's, well, these technologies, you read about them every day and they're just on the cusp of being implemented. And if you can have a, you know, a virus, if you can deal with COVID within 12 months, why can't you solve some of these other problems? Yeah, I tend to agree with you. It does feel like, you know, I, I would actually, despite working in, in crypto, I'd sort of bucket myself as a, as a relative skeptic of technology, but it just does seem like, and to give some of the folks in Washington some credit, they're, they're dealing with truly uh, disruptive technology here. Crypto is at its heart a super disruptive technology and paradigm. Same thing with AI. You know, I mean, this AI stuff, you know, for the first time, you've been hearing about this forever, right? But it really does seem like it's quite real now and already having implications in the business environment. And that plus the demographics, I just think we're going to have to, you know, to your point about banks, maybe to bring this full full circle to the beginning of discussion, we're probably going to be questioning a lot of stuff. You know, maybe it's how the banking system works. Maybe it's how the education system works. All of this different stuff is going to be questioned. And, you know, I think there are, you could view that, you know, with a sense of fear and there's probably, there's probably some justification to doing that. You can also be optimistic and say change is the way of the world and this is how we make things better. So I, I'm ultimately very excited about the future. Well, I think, I yeah, I'm a, it's stuff. funny. I was going to go to glass half full as well. Um, mm. I would say um, on the glass half full side, we have full employment in the United yeah. States. Life has never been so good as it is in the United States today, and we're an incredibly wealthy country. Okay, yes, <laughs> we have problems, but like, just let's not always look at the downside of everything. I think the the dynamic that's in the air right now uh, is: do we have any control over technology as a general matter? So, I, you know, the world started harnessing technology to create wealth in about 1860. Before then, it was like, hey, can we just feed ourselves? Right. And then as we started saving money and we used you know, the factory and all these different, different, different technologies. But business is very pro-technology because businesses can create new products or um, you know, use technology to cut costs. So they're going to deploy it like crazy. Like whether we mm -hmm. like AI or not, every yeah. private enterprise has this incentive to adopt this technology. And I think we're, with social media, us in the United States being unable to regulate social media, we're looking at another major technology that's taking over our lives and we can't really stop it. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that makes us uneasy, um, but it shouldn't make us unhappy. How about that? <laughs> I agree with that, Jan. I totally agree. And thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. This has been a great, great chat. And I'm sure the audience thinks so as well. If they want to find out more about you or the work that you do at Van Eck or, or anything like that, what is the best way to either get more information about Van Eck or, or follow you? Sure. Well, we, we do a lot of the outlooks on Van Eck.com. Um, they can follow our investment outlooks there. Uh, I'm on, on LinkedIn uh, and uh, Twitter, Jan Van Eck, uh, number three. So um, I tend to share some podcasts I like and content uh, uh, on, on LinkedIn more than Twitter. But uh, I love I love Blockworks. I haven't been to Permissionless yet. Um, but, I'm, you know, uh, I, I think you guys do a great job in a, a number of your different media. So uh, I was I, I'm really glad to be included. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. All right. Thanks so much. We'll have to do it again soon. Great. Have a good weekend. You too.